That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now. From the beginning. Welcome to BX, Beyond Stereotypes, a podcast about lawyers using their authentic voices to change the world. I'll be honest, folks. You know, uh, I say to my students, you need to look in the mirror. When we talk about issues of self-defense, and you remember back to the Bernie Getz case, you know, the the guy on the New York subway and that he shot those young men. I hope none of you are like him, but you're all a little bit racist. Do you cross the street because certain types of people are walking down on your side? Do you get nervous? Do you grab your purse? Um, And if you say you don't, I don't believe you. Welcome to BS Beyond Stereotypes. I'm your host, Merle Vaughn. Here to BS with me today is Lori Levinson, whose story I find fascinating and who will no doubt inspire all of you to embrace your authenticity. Hey, Lori, how are you? Hey, Merle, this is wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm I'm really uh, honored uh, to have you here. I, I usually... I only get to talk to you at Thanksgiving dinner. (laughs) (laughs) And that's fun, too. (laughs) So um, just to give our audience an idea of um, who we're talking to, I have to say that I I Googled Lori and up came a Wikipedia page. And I was like, oh, (laughs) I knew you were a a badass, but now I really know you're a badass. Lori is a professor um, of law and the and William William M. Raines Fellow, uh, and the David W. Berkham Chair in Ethical Advocacy. Try saying that five times fast. And the director of the Center for Legal Advocacy at Loyola Law School, uh, Loyola at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Um, she teaches various. Uh, uh, classes, most of uh, which I uh, did not get great grades in. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, are, I don't know if you, and you have served as the Associate Dean of Academics um, uh, and Director of the Loyola Center for Ethical Advocacy. Um, you attended uh, Stanford University undergrad, UCLA Law School with my husband, uh, Jeff Lasley. And um, it seems like uh, half of the people I've interviewed have been uh, classmates of Jeff. So very um, memorable, very memorable. You guys had a great, great, great class. Um, I know that you also uh, the way I know you best is as a parent at Harvard Westlake. Our our, uh, daughters were there together. And my my favorite uh, my favorite memory of you is at the basketball games, passing out halftime holla. <laughs> so, welcome welcome to BS, Lori. Uh, appreciate your your being here. Thank you. I am really happy to be here. And and did what did I leave out? Because I don't you know, you never know how accurate these things are. No, I think you basically described who I am. I'm a nerdy law professor. I've been teaching since the earth cooled. I've had over 10,000 students and I love it. I've taught at every level. I've taught as a law professor. I've even taught those kids at Harvard Westlake. I guess the only other thing I would add to all this is that I had the privilege of starting what's called Loyola's Project for the Innocent. So even though I'm a former prosecutor, as you know, and I spent eight years prosecuting federal crimes, when I became a professor uh, with the urging of students, I started an innocence project. Right. And, and and we will definitely um, get to that because I, I was fascinated by some of the things that, that you told me. Uh, and, and I also watched um, your TED talk um, uh, about that, which if anybody hasn't, whoever hasn't seen it should watch is fascinating. Um, so let, let's kind of start from the beginning, though, Lori, you know, tell tell us tell us where you're from and you know, where you grew up and 
what influences your your um, childhood and your parents had on you? Well, you know, when I tell people where I grew up, sometimes they're a little surprised because I grew up in a community called Inglewood. And it was down near where they were just building the fabulous forum. In fact, you know, during the lunch hour of high school, don't tell anybody, but we would run over to this new forum. We would buy tickets so we could scalp them later. So that's sort of my upbringing. I grew up. Um, that was hometown for me. It was a somewhat turbulent time, to be honest with you, because of changing demographics and changing neighborhoods. But my dad was uh, a community doctor in the area, and we just stayed. And we lived there, and that's where I grew up. I was in Girl Scouts, and I still run a Girl Scout troop, although for unhoused Girl Scouts now, homeless kids. Um, and I had, you know, the life of living in that community. And I understand, um, from my perspective, I understand what it's like to li- to grow up in that type of community because I grew up in Compton. I went to Dominguez High School. We actually, I was a cheerleader. We actually played. I think you went to Inglewood High. Um, and yeah, and we actually played Inglewood in basketball. Um, but Inglewood was tough in basketball. I want to tell you, um, you might have won that game. I can also share with you, I was not a cheerleader. That would have worked <laughs> out so well. I was a nerd. You know, I did the, the yearbook and I did the newspaper and all of those things sort of hid inside uh, during much of my high school career. And and I was a nerd too, but I was a, I was a cool nerd. But, <laughs> but let me I, I those were tough times for me Lori it was really difficult yeah. especially if you you know like to learn and you know you were smart and like to learn and and wanted to go to school um it was hard that's when when um gangs were just forming my school was uh back then Piru what people know now as bloods um you had to have experienced yeah. some of that and I was mortified I it shaped me I still have PS PTSD from it. Um, it was very dicey is what I would say. Um, we had the Crips and the Bloods. They were always fighting against each other. I saw knivings on campus. Someone burned down one of the buildings on campus. And as I said, I hid in, in the library until they burned down a part of the library um, <laughs> because I just couldn't function. You know, and, and there were times where you know, I would have students come up and take steal money from me. And I just, you know, my goal here was to survive. Right. And so I actually left high school a year early because it was that traumatic. And I was very young. And my parents said, well, you can go to someplace nearby. So I parked myself at a brand new college at the time. It's called UC Irvine. They had more cows than they had students, but it wasn't <laughs> at least Inglewood. Because in Inglewood, if you weren't in a gang, you were very, very vulnerable. And if you were in a gang, gee, I don't even imagine what that life is like. Right. And, you know, the parallels here are pretty uncanny. I I um, left Dominguez uh, early as well. I was 16 and I went to USC on a spe- special program called the Resident Honors Program for the very same reasons. And it's interesting that, you know, some people and this is this is where stereotypes come in. Right. You know, right. people would not have would not expect you to, you know, with all the things that you've done and what you're doing now to have had that that upbringing. Uh, people certainly wouldn't you know, they may not expect me to have it, but nobody, I think, would expect us to have such similar uh, experiences because we look so different. I think that's right. I mean, I think people, of course, judge everyone on how they look. Um, But the truth is that was my life experience. And so when I graduated from high school, I think many more people were going, you know, into criminal life, literally into prisons than Mm -hmm. they were to four-year universities. And then when I became a prosecutor, I did prosecute people I went to high school with. And, you know, um, the other thing is people just assume that I'm white. So if I'm white, I didn't have any black friends. I did. But our school was not really conducive to that. They really divided up. I remember at one point, this idiot principal, and I'm just going to say that, (laughs) called an assembly and all the white students sat on one side and all the black students on the other side. And can you believe the guy got up and he says, you know, 
we have to all get along. Let's hear it for the blacks. Let's hear <gasps> it for the whites. And I thought, this guy is going to get everybody hurt here. Killed. That is not the way to bring kids together. And so the grown-ups didn't know how to deal with this. They really didn't. Well, and, you know, they still don't, right? Right. Um, and I'm sure you see some of that at, at Harvard Westlake, where it's just people just don't know. I mean, they may be well, well-meaning, well but they don't necessarily know what to do, especially if they've not had the type of lived experiences that we have. But that's right. I think people like think an answer is going to be in a book and it's not. You know, I did end up at Stanford and I remember when I went there, all these people seemed really smart and they had done all these things I'd never done, you know, and taken these fancy courses. But the one thing they didn't know was the real world. Yep. They never met anybody who wasn't affluent. They never met anybody who may not have had enough food. Uh, the idea that you might share clothes with people. And the other idea, and let's just be honest, that you might be scared, that you would learn certain instincts of where you go and who associates with whom and, and who you don't. And you know what I'm learning as I get older, and boy, I just had a birthday on Monday, and I'm, I Happy can't believe birthday. how, thank you, I can't Happy believe high. how old, <laughs> old I'm getting. But what I've, what I've learned is that, you know, the, all of those things tend to, to uh tend to form whether or not you trust, right? Who, you know, what can you trust? Who can you trust? Um, and and sometimes that can be debilitating. Right. I, I do think there's an initial caution and sort of trying to scope out who somebody really is, which is, you know, something that affects you all your life, to be honest with you. And, you know, as I've gone on, I see this in my students as well wherever I, you know, wherever I teach, uh, they're trying to figure out who the other is. Mm -hmm. So why or how, you said your father was a doctor. Why did you decide to go to law school? Well, that's a great story. I was actually a pre-med in college and I even worked with midwives in college, but here's the little secret. I had to take some breath courses and I liked them so much more. I really did. And I hated <laughs> organic chemistry. And anybody who's listening knows what I mean here. And yeah. finally, I took the MCAT and the LSAT. And big surprise. I did a heck of a lot better on the LSAT. Got it. So so it just so it kind of picked yeah, you. No. Huh? It picked me. And I remember when I applied to law school thinking, don't ask why you're here. Do not ask why you're here. Just go there and learn as much as you can. And there were a lot of people there who knew exactly what kind of corporate lawyer they wanted to be. But I didn't. I just thought, boy, isn't this stuff interesting? You know, like it's an orderly world. And maybe the fact that I had had so much disorder earlier in my life, this had a big appeal to me. And so you graduated from law school and you and you clerked um, for the Third Circuit. I did. I clerked for a heavenly man. His name was Jim Hunter in Camden, New Jersey, which, by the way, is the arson capital or was. <laughs> world. Uh, when I showed up for my clerkship, the judge handed me mace and a very large co-clerk and said, this is what you will need. Now, this may be the only time having lived in Inkwood, I kind of sort of said, okay, I can maneuver this. It was a very <laughs> depressed area at the time. The only um, the only company there was Campbell's Soup wafting through the air. Since then, they've gotten big industry. They got in a prison. So that elevated the living status of people. Um, but having said all that, Judge Hunter was wonderful. And how wonderful was he? I actually named my daughter after him when he passed away. Mm -hmm. And she's now one who's a federal prosecutor as well. Yes, I know. And we are also very proud of her. Uh, um, I would say that. So especially, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of things for her to work on right now. And and um, we're, we're sending her good vibes. Um, so you go to law school, you, you clerk, and then you go into government. Right. And that was very strategic. You know, I took a look at the world and said, where would they let somebody like me, like this small Jewish girl, get in the courtroom and try some cases? And I realized these big law firms, they would never do that. 
I would spend years just writing memos and the like. And so, um, you know, I had never heard of the U.S. Attorney's Office, but one of my mentors in law school said, you know, the new U.S. Attorney is a former student of mine. Why don't you make some contact with her? And here's a tip for anybody listening who maybe is looking for a new job. I flew out to L.A. I knocked on the door. I sat there and they said, we don't hire people without experience. I didn't leave. I said, <laughs> sours. I said, I really want this job. And then I ended up talking to the chief of criminal who um, he didn't really care what I knew about the law. I had tutored the Stanford football players. <laughs> he loved Stanford football and I was hired. You know, and it's funny as a recruiter, those are the kind of things that's that's why we tell people to make sure that they put interesting things on their resume, uh, things that uh, maybe because, again, because of stereotypes. Right. And and, right. and maybe even some bi uh, conscious or unconscious biases, you know, you're always trying to f find um, common ground with folks and you can pretty much do it with everyone uh, if, if, if you're willing to be a little bit vulnerable and open. I think that's great advice because that's true. You know what? Nobody saw me, I think, as the trial lawyer. And, you know, it's disarming actually for opponents when somebody like me walks in because they do expect you know, they start calling you honey and sweetheart. And the judge says, you don't know her very well. Um, She's from Eaglewood. She's got mates. <laughs> so, you know, it can sometimes be to your benefit. But I also know that for me, I had, as you say, take risks. It, it's, it's a little scary. So I'm really, and, and I don't know that I, I, I don't remember whether I mentioned this, but I know that you have done a lot of TV commentary uh, for trials. Well, um, the O.J. Simpson case, Rodney King case, Men Menendez murder, and and a lot of others. How how did that tell our tell our audience and maybe some of the listeners who want to do those kind of things how that happened? Well, true but unbelievable story. So you know, I from Los Angeles, and we all went through what Rodney King was, including the riot that happened after the first verdict. And I wrote an op-ed piece for the LA Times and then NPR called me when they were gonna have the federal trial and they said, can you help us? I said, well, I've never done any journalism. No, I don't think so. And I frankly was still nursing a child. <laughs> they mm -hmm. said, can you come on down and just like explain things? Do you know anything about federal law? And those were fighting words. I had been <laughs> a prosecutor. I had trained that judge and trained that prosecutor. So I, I, I went down there. And I just did what I do, which is answer questions. And at one point, the CBS producer yells out, grab Levinson. She's all we've got. And that oh, wow. launched my career on television because I was willing to answer questions. And I never saw myself as, you know, crossing over into entertainment or TV or the media. But it did seem to me it was really important to the community. In fact, that was impressed on me. I, I would get there at about 1.30 in the morning to stand in line to get a seat in the courtroom because it was a small courtroom. I didn't have a special seat. And I remember a woman standing next to me and I said, well, I know why I'm here. Why are you here? And she said, it was my community or she actually said it was my street that burned down. Mm -hmm. And I want to see if there can be justice. And boy. That was a real lesson to me. There are people that it really affected. And I had a chance just to sort of explain what the heck is going on. And ha have you done any of those recently? Anything that um, I know there have been some uh, very major trials uh, lately. Um, have you? Know. Yeah, no, so the truth is, is now I both have a face for radio and we are kind of <laughs> locked down again. So I haven't done as much TV, but I did radio as recently as yesterday and TV as recently as last week, albeit over Zoom. You know, people have heard about the George Floyd case, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, uh, the Elizabeth Holmes case, um, you know, and maybe we'll have some other big profile cases coming up. So Yes, uh, I seem to be on someone's speed dial primarily for CBS News. Well, I feel honored that you're spending this time with us. <laughs> I am, I, you know, thank you so much, Lori. So um, 
are you let's talk about t- uh, teaching kids the the I know that you have uh, the uh, wrongful convention a con- conviction innocence club uh, at Harvard Westlake. I also know that you started a camp justice, a summer camp right um, for for kids. You, you do a lot of things um, for kids. Talk to us about why you do that and why it's important. Um, I love kids. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to have my own three kids, but I've always considered all of their friends, including your daughter, to be my kids too. I mean, they are our future folks and they don't have all the cynicism. You know, dealing with adults can be a real pain, but kids, they really bring an energy um, and they're grateful, the kids that I've worked with. So I do, I mean, a lot of what I did start at Harvard Wesley because my kids were there, but now at Loyola, I run the Innocence Project, which is like a little law firm that helps people who have been wrongfully convicted get out of prison. And we decided, I decided, that there are so many kids out there who are looking for a way to help. And they can get out of what they've been doing and learn about new people. You know, the, when they just meet our exonerees, their mm-hmm. life changes. Because, for example, our first exoneree was a guy who grew up on the streets of L.A. Um, He was raised by a gang because his parents were incarcerated. He spent 17 years in prison for a crime he didn't get out. And he's the loveliest person you'll ever meet. And now that he's out, he helps others. He loves interacting with kids. And that's a type of education, believe me, kids will never receive in a classroom. So I try to give kids an avenue to learn and to help. And, you know, that I think brings them together. And it's not just Harvard Wesley kids. I do want to emphasize, I got kids from all sorts of schools, including homeschooling, because, you know, these are kids who want to learn something and who wouldn't want to be with them. Right. And and the the um, TED Talk that I mentioned, you, you told a very compelling story about an exoneree. Um, and I mean, I, can you just talk a little bit about and I and, and I'm not sure if this is the one that actually ended up going to law school. Oh, we've had uh, uh, some go to law school. Uh, the one I talked about in my TED talk is a guy named Obi Anthony, and he's the one who grew up on the streets of L.A. and then in prison taught himself. I mean, that's the other impressive thing. When you hear kids complain about the classes, then you realize that you can tell them and introduce them to people who went to prison and still were able to make their lives. But um, more recently, there is a fellow named Jared Adams who um, he ended up in prison wrongfully convicted. And when he got out, he remade his life and he did go to law school. He did clerk for a judge. Now he has a successful practice. He's written a book. um, And I was on a program with him and Cory Booker, the senator, was on the program. But nobody wanted to hear from Senator Booker. They (laughs) wanted to hear from the exonerate. That is amazing. And one of the things that you and I kind of have chatted about before is this back to this idea of of your upbringing and the fact that you, you know, were uh, bullied um, and you had uh, money taken from you. You were robbed and by kids and and all of that. And you still, you know, and you became a prosecutor. But now, you know, you're helping people. Uh, get out of prison and you're you're helping folks who you know might have been some of the people or their kids um maybe you know maybe people who might have um treated you badly how do you how do you justify that you know that is a great question because we're all just human so yeah i i was sort of bullied and beat up in high school. And I didn't say that the first time we talked because again, I don't love going to that space in my memory, but there were three times that basically that happened. And that's one of the reasons I left. And then, you know, I started an innocence project and my husband and I are walking from the expo line in an early evening and we are robbed at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. Now that is really traumatic. And I hope your listeners haven't gone through it. And I remember thinking at the time, first of all, the guy didn't know how to hold a gun, but I wasn't going to tell him the right way. 
I was really scared, but I was definitely more scared for my husband. I knew I was just going to give this guy everything I had. And I also knew I was never going to represent him through the Innocence Project. <laughs> so um, it took me sort of almost intellectualizing a really emotional, traumatic event to separate the two. And then to come back the next day and realize there are people who belong in prison, but not all the people we've done. And what we've done is scared ourselves. Mm -hmm. And by a result of scaring ourselves and labeling ourselves, we haven't been careful about who goes to our prisons. There are people who need to be there, probably not as long as we send them. But, uh, but the guys who robbed me, they were idiot kids being jumped into a gang. And I keep thinking, just what if they had had another direction to go? Right. Justice Breyer, uh, he's retiring. Uh, and uh, President Biden has gone on record saying that he's he's going to appoint um, a, a black female to the to the Supreme Court. Um, I'd just like to hear you talk about that. Yeah, you know, I've heard various things said, like, gee, isn't that limiting him? Or why would he politically do that? Isn't that going to make all the white males or Asians or whatever angry by doing that. And I, I don't see that way, although I know politics is key to any appointment. So anyone who thinks Biden, the first one doing this, hasn't been paying attention, I actually think it's a great move. And I'll tell you why. First of all, we are blessed with unbelievably qualified candidates, right. Black women who have waited too long in line to reach the highest level. And probably let's just take as an example, Judge Jackson on the DC circuit who, you know, here's a person who has the pedigree, you know, the Ivy League. She has served as in private practice and as a public defender. She's been a trial judge and an appellate judge. You know, guys have had less than that characteristics for a long time and she is qualified. So I hope people aren't saying that just by trying to bring diversity, uh, that we're kind of lowering the standards. We are increasing the standards. The problem with our Supreme Court always has been is that people have only seen things through a certain life experience. I would love to bring the rest of America's life experience onto a court that's deciding such important issues. Hey, they're deciding affirmative action next year. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Clarence Thomas does not represent the view of most African Americans who are looking at this issue. So, you know, let's have somebody else who might be able to represent other people's views as well. Here, here, <laughs> and it, and it is long overdue. It's it's just it's unbelievable that we're still having these conversations in 2022. I think it is, um, but I'm not surprised. I, no. look, I mean, we haven't used the T word yet in our discussion, but what happened during the Trump administration is going to have long lasting scars and impact on America. And, and one of them is this discussion, honest discussion of what difference does race and stereotype type mean? Um, and because our country is so divided, we always seem to be going to the wrong place, the bad place, that people are getting some break they don't deserve. Every single of the, one of those women who've been mentioned, you know, Justice Kroger on the California Supreme Court, and, you know, Stacey Abrams relative, but like all of them are superb. There's not one lesser judge in the bunch. So, and, and so, you know, I love that you keep going back to stereotypes. I love that you, you know, are are always thinking about that. You know, what what makes you unique? You know, why, you know, why do you think that you are comfortable talking about these things? I mean, because most people find this this would find this to be a courageous conversation, oh, right? Not at all. Um well, uh, because I think it's reality. I I I'll put it that way. You know, I I've been in the classroom. That's really where I'm happiest. Don't tell my husband, but I, I, <laughs> I love being in the classroom. 
And I know the difference between teaching a class that has just one or two students of color and teaching a class that represents the you know community that the students are supposed to go out and serve. Um, I, you know, I've also frankly had to look in the mirror a little bit. I'll be honest, folks. You know, uh, I say to my students, you need to look in the mirror. When we talk about issues of self-defense, and you remember back to the Bernie Getz case, you know, the, the guy on the New York subway and that yeah. he shot those young men. I hope none of you are like him, but you're all a little bit racist. Do you cross the street because certain types of people are walking down on your side? Do you get nervous? Do you grab your purse? Um, and if you say you don't, I don't believe you. Um, so it, the first thing to do is for me to acknowledge any biases I have, and I still have to think about it, you know, I do. Uh, but I just think that my upbringing, let's, let's give a shout out to Inglewood. <laughs> and let's give a shout out just to some of the issues I've lived through in my life and some of the people that I've represented. They teach me, they are my family. You know, when you sit with somebody who spent 40 years in prison, probably in large part because they were the only black person in the courtroom and the jury and the judge and the prosecutor and the cops were all white, then you sort of say, oh, this cannot be right. You know, you can't be part of this. Just can't be part of this. You know, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, those those experiences, uh, you know, continue. I mean, I, I was in Tiffany, wearing Tiffany jewelry, uh, walking around looking at stuff, and recently got followed right. um, in the store. And you know, and 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 you have to ask. And I'm I'm that person who stops, turns, and says, "Why are you following me?" Good for you. Good for you. And, and get a response. And, and the response is, oh, I'm I'm not following you. I just I just want to help you. But you didn't ask me if you could help me. Um, you know, and it's it's just you know, the the, the idea that ju it's just because of the color of my skin. And I have lovely skin, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, causes that type of reaction. I mean, I and and, and I'm you know, there shouldn't be anything frightening about me, although I've been told on many occasions that I'm intimidating and scary, but um, go figure. I think um, I'm smart and accomplished, but go oh, ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, I think if people could just say to themselves, how would I feel mm. if that were happening to me? If, first of all, they have to believe it. Right. Because if you've never had the experience personally, I think a lot of times these things are hard to believe. But once you believe it, if you could just say to yourself, how would I feel? I mean, do you think that that. <laughs> I want to tell you, you hit it on the nose and I'll tell you a story that has affected me so much. The O.J. Simpson verdict comes out and I'm there. And I think many people will remember the world divided up between black and white. And it happened to be on the eve of the holiest day of the Jewish year, something called Yom Kippur called Nitra. And I, I'm, I'm leaving the CBS media camp, camp or whatever, heading home. And a, law, a tall African-American man comes towards me. And I just say, I don't need this today. The world is divided up between black and white. I happen to have been someone who thought OJ was guilty of sin, but um, having said that, and this guy comes up to me and he puts his arm around me and I'm going, oh God, <laughs> he turns to me and he says, you know, I'm an LAPD officer. Thank you. He's African-American. Mm. And I thought about, gee, I think I have it tough. Talk about people trying to cross the lines in both directions. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do. We just, you know, because it happens on all sides. It really does. We've just sort of labeled people. We segregated people. And uh, I 
And I, I, I think it's something that just, we'd like it not to be part of the conversation. It's too uncomfortable, but it's gotta be part of the conversation. Right, right. So I know, you know, how tall are you? Five, one, five, five two. one. I'm a towering five, one. Okay. So I'm sure that people, you know, uh, have, have, uh, have stereotypes about you because of your 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 stature and all that. What other types of stereotypes do you feel like you've had to overcome? Well, uh, I did try cases and I did have defense lawyers sort of look down and call me little girl or honey or the like. And I remember one courtroom where the defense lawyer had done that sort of was demeaning me and thank God for Judge Waters. What a blessed elderly man. He calls us up at sidebar and uh, he says, so Ms. Levinson, do you want to tell opposing counsel what your nickname really is here? Now, I don't know. You might have to censor this out, but I'll tell you. I said, yes, your honor, bitch goddess. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the stereotype was that I was just a little girl. I was young. I was small. I was short and he was going to bully me. And so the number one stereotype, actually, and I think, you know, this goes beyond race and I mean, people find ways to bully each other. Yep. That, that's hard. Yes. And I, you know, I do think that because I was bullied, I wasn't, I was actually a small kid until I didn't really grow until I went to college, but, um, and I was bullied uh, because I was fairly short for a while and, and I was smart and believe it or not, because I had long hair, that was crazy. You know, they was like, wow. we want to cut off your hair. Um, but when you're bullied, at least for me, having been bullied and then you grow up and you realize you go to law school and you can fight on paper and there's ways to, you yeah. don't have to, you know, you don't, you're not worried about a uh, physical harm anymore or fighting physically. That's, it's really uh, liberating. Yeah, to, it's empowering. To, it's empowering. Yes. Yeah, yes. Protect yourself. And maybe that's what attracts me to the kids is to find ways for them, you know, because as you know, in a place like you know, Harvard West, like especially, there's a certain athletic prowess that gets respect. And what I love is kids finding ways for them to be respected for nice things they do, for smart things they do. Right, right. And what, and I don't know about you, but one of the things that that, had, that affected me by having been bullied was that I'm always rooting for the underdog. Uh -huh. I, I, you know, I have, a, you know, I'm an ally always for the underdog, sometimes to my detriment, because I will speak up for people who didn't ask me to speak up for them. That's such a great insight. I haven't come to that insight until now with you, so I thank you. Uh, but I do, obviously, trend towards rooting for the underdog, you know, even in, you know, athletic events and, and, and clearly my clients and even the students who are struggling. Yeah, I think there's something really true about that, which is, you know, leave no person behind. That That's always been something I've embraced, I hope. And I try to teach them to embrace that too. Well, one thing that you said to me when we were talking once was you said, that there are no disposable people. I wrote that down because I, I think that that's a beautiful way of looking at life. That is our motto. That is on our T-shirts. Two things on our T-shirts. One is, who can I help today? And the other is, there is no there are no disposable people. And I actually learned that from inmates. They feel like somebody's put them in a big waste bin and they're not even people anymore. And I think that, you know, maybe some of my religious background, too, sort of says that's wrong. That's just wrong. So what words of encouragement or advice do you have? Because, you know, I would say that you're one of the most I, I love authentic people. I strive to stay authentic. Um, and you're one of the most authentic people I know. Like, you know, you, you would bring birthday cakes to high school for the whole school and which most kids would be totally embarrassed by. And your, your kids loved it. You know, like I said, halftime holla. I had never had holla until I had it at halftime at a, at a Harvard Westlake, uh, a game, you know, you, you know, embody authenticity. What, 
what, and you've done well. Um, and that's what I want to encourage. I want to encourage people to get beyond their, their stere the stereotypes and also stay authentic. What advice or, or words of encouragement do you have to, for our audience um, about that? Wow. Um, well, I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is to listen to you, Merle, because you know, <laughs> I think I've learned so much even on this call. I, you know, I, just enjoy being who you are. Find, like yourself a little bit, like who you are, and you're right, a halftime holla. Friday nights have always been special for us because for us, it's the Sabbath. So if I'm going out there, I'm bringing it with me. <laughs> um, you know, I tell stories about myself because that's the only way I think people will know who the real me is. Uh, you know, um, so maybe one way to say to people is the real you is great. You don't have to be anyone other than the real you. You just have to share with other people and then they'll love it, too. Is there anything else that you want people to know about Lori, about what you're doing, about your projects, about anything you'd like, you know, to invite people to get involved in? Is there anything else you'd like to share before we end? Yeah, shameless promotion, but I thank you for that. Um, I do run Loyola's Project for the Innocent. There are other innocence projects across the country. If you're looking for a way to help people who really, really do deserve your help, because the one thing we can all identify with is being unfairly accused. Every single person has had that happen in their life, and you know how bad that feels. You know, yes. even if your siblings or parents or a friend has done it. Um, and you don't have to be a lawyer. I love saying that but you're looking for a way to help, reach out to me at Loyola Law School and I will help. Um, and the other thing I would say is thank you for continuing to listen and be involved. You don't have to go the way of helping my project, even though we would love your support. But, uh, you know, it, it just, just think of the people who you have not connected with lately and figure out a way to connect with them. That is the only way in my life we're going to get beyond where we've been. And that is a perfect place to end. Lori, I just have goosebumps here listening to you. I'm so glad that you agreed to BS with me today. I'm so glad that you're in my life and that we're weird. I consider you a friend. And I just want to say thank you. I feel the same. Thank you so much to you. Really, this is the best BS I've ever done. <laughs> and thank you to everyone for listening. And until the next episode, remember that everybody is different and different is good. Hit it. That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. We hope you enjoyed the stories shared in today's episode of BS, Beyond Stereotypes. Join us next time when another authentic personality unleashes their uniqueness on the world.